Hello, hello. This is Thumbs United. We are running around in Horizon. And we're gonna be doing mostly community maps, and we're doing it against pro drivers. So let's get started. It was an eventful day yesterday, and the day before yesterday, I I, uh, I acquired a, a 3D printer about a week ago, and I finally put it together over the weekend, and then uh, I did uh, my first print on Sunday, and it worked really well. It's uh, the printer was like 140 I got it on sale and it was one I was always eyeballing but it's one you know it's it's an entry level one quote unquote uh, but I've used this is my third 3D printer the first one I did it worked okay uh, but it did catch on fire and uh So it did catch on fire, that's a big problem. Then I ordered a very small one. And it worked pretty well, but it's it was a little when I ordered it, it was an open box and it was damaged and I fixed it. Uh and it was printing well, but now I was like, uh there was kind of some suspicious stuff going on with the extruder to where I didn't trust it and I thought uh it might catch on fire again too. So I I didn't throw it away. I still have it. Uh, I plan on fixing it more, but so I ordered this replacement one, and it is uh, the um, it's the Ender Three, which has had pretty good reviews, and uh, it's usually higher in price. So the fact that I was able to get it for so low uh, was pretty good. But so the first print, well, one, it's all metal, which is good because my first 3D printer was it's like an open source printer. So anyone could build them, uh, but I got it as a kit. And so all the pieces were there. And, and like I said, it was built out of wood and it looked kind of janky, but um, and do, do, do. Do, do, do. And uh, so it was built out of wood and I printed several things with it and then it just, Something happened where it caught on fire. It accidentally lit the plastic, the ABS, on fire. Oh, I remember. So what happened was the thermometer fell out. And these printers are pretty s simple. So uh, what they do is it's essentially like a hot glue gun where it feeds in the plastic and then it melts it and kind of spits it out on the, on the heater bed. And... Uh, so it has to be the right temperature. So there's a little digital thermometer inside the extruder. That's the part that melts the plastic. And so that fell out while it was printing. And uh, it's simple because it's just like, oh, I'm, it's too cold. So it kept, you know, heating up the, uh, the extruder. And so the plastic, it melts at a certain temperature. It's like 240 degrees Celsius that it melts the plastic. But uh, because the thermometer fell out and it's not in the extruder, of course, it's just like the ambient air. So the printer said, oh, it's too cold. I'm going to heat up the extruder even more. It doesn't know that the thermometer is not in the extruder. 
And so once it gets to a certain point, the plastic can ignite. So it just probably cranked it up as high, maybe 300 or 400 degrees Celsius. And then it just, you know, caught on fire. And so I had it set out where it was in the middle of the room. So there's nothing that it could, you know, touch. But, uh, yeah, so that was fun. My sister called me at like two in the morning and I was like, uh, there's some smoke. And so then I went down and, uh, with the fire extinguisher and put it out. Now it was, it's in the basement, uh, and it's closed off, but it was crazy because it was just a wall of smoke and, uh, Like, you couldn't see anything. It was really weird. So the lights and everything were on in the basement. And it's like those fluorescent lights. Uh, and the smoke was completely white, but you couldn't see anything. And, of course, it was, like, suffocating and stuff. And, uh... So that was scary. Because, like, you literally couldn't see where you were going. Uh, and smoke burned your eyes and everything. So then I was like, you know what, that's it. I'm not getting any more 3D printers that are built out of wood. And they need to be sturdier. So then I got this smaller one. This, I think it's King Room. And it worked well. But like I said, there was something weird that was happening with the extruder. And so I was like, that's what caught on fire in the other one. So I don't trust it anymore. So this Ender one, it's, it's bigger. It's about, uh, the bed is around nine inches by nine inches. And then I think it can print up to 10, 10 inches tall. So it's a lot bigger than the other ones I was using. And I had dedicated like a couple hours to building it. It maybe took 30 minutes to build. It was so simple to put together. And part of that is because like I've put together printers. I have experience with putting together printers. Whoa. I'm not doing well at all. So then, I uh, printed the first thing uh, and I had it printing in my office, which isn't so good because there are fumes that are slightly toxic. Uh, but it printed the first thing exceptionally well. Like, I didn't even need... Sometimes you have to put, like, an adhesive on the heater bed to get the plastic, the first layer to stick. It had no problem. Uh, my mom wanted these holders. Uh, she's into calligraphy and everything. And so she has, like, these little ink vials. And so she found on uh, online, somebody had published it. They're called STL files, but they're for 3D printing files. They're like a PDF of 3D printing. And so I was like, okay. So I printed that first. And, and like I said, it came out really well. It took 12 hours. And that kind of messed up my sleep schedule. I started it at around 1, and it finished at like one ish like 150 so it was almost 13 hours but it came out well and then yesterday night I printed a second one because she needed another one and that one came out well as well but again I I didn't keep it in my office I moved it uh, to the garage and I also built this thing out of PVC. Uh, with the plastics and everything, you have to... Uh, temperature is a really big deal. And so the, the extruder turns the plastic into kind of a molten form. And then it drips onto the heater bed, which, has, which stays around... Uh, I have it stay at 80 degrees Celsius. And so it keeps it slightly molten, so it sticks. 
uh, and doesn't move. But as the printer prints up and your object gets, you know, taller and taller, uh, there's a difference in temperature between the heater bed and the rest to eventually where it's not heated up at all. And so because of those temperature differences, uh, sometimes there's warping where it will slowly start to kind of curl in on itself. Sometimes it's not noticeable, but uh, a lot of that has to do with, you know, as it's printing higher, it's cooling off faster and faster, and that pulls things, creates a bit of tension on the, the device you're printing. And so having a drafty area where there's a lot of cold air that comes in and out is actually bad for 3D printing. So I built this thing out of PVC and it's just a frame that goes around the printer and then that's covered with clear plastic it was like maybe four dollars i got and it's for uh, for painting you know you cover the furniture and stuff you don't want paint on and so then it's essentially enclosed in that and so there's no drafting and then the uh from the outside air and then the advantage of that is like the extruder is really high it's 240 degrees celsius the heater bed is hot as well it's 80 degrees celsius and uh, so that creates a lot of heat and the plastic uh, wrapping frame kind of keeps that heat inside the 3d printer and so that's pretty good as well because normally with a 3d printer you want to keep the ambient temperature around like 75 degrees uh, Fahrenheit so it's supposed to be warm and that helps out a lot too and uh, a lot of the higher end 3d printers the 300 and 400 and thousand dollar printers have their own enclosure and will actually heat up the ambient air inside uh, to the correct temperature So yeah, so all oh, that went really well. And like I already trust this printer a lot more. Uh, the materials it's built out of are a lot more heavy duty. It's put together very well. The instructions were very simple and accurate. A lot of times you'll get the instructions have no words in it. And this one was just pictures too, but the pictures were uh, were accurate to the parts, and framed in a way that you could tell, you know, which way the part goes and everything. And like I said, like for the wooden printer, my first one, it took about eight hours to build. Uh, there was just so much you had to do, but with this one, it took like under 40 minutes easily under 40 minutes and so the main goal is I have a lot of parts in my house that are falling apart like just wooden things and and stuff and so the goal is I'm gonna print like uh, replacements uh, for broken wooden structures and, and things like that and then paint over it so that's the main goal the secondary goal is uh, i do a lot of flying and i put the drone photography on here and so i do the quadcopter but originally what i did is fixed wing so with remote control airplanes and they're just a few i'm doing more custom airplanes where i'll start off with a kit and then i make modifications like to the millennium falcon and then uh, do, do, do. and then uh, and then yeah there's just a couple like funny things like I need to make a spacer for the wheels because I converted the wheels to uh, connects wheels those giant yellow ones uh, because it had smaller wheels, but it would always get stuck on the grass. 
and there's an airfield and it's really well taken care of but just couldn't the landing gear just couldn't handle the grass like any grass it could only take off from like cement and I want to fly in like dirt roads and stuff and I've gotten to the point where I don't want to throw the airplane a lot of times what you do is uh, you have no landing gear and you throw it into the air and then it takes off but the cameras I have on the airplane are kind of heavy so it will do this thing where you throw it in the air and the, you know the motor will be going as fast as possible and uh, sometimes it doesn't build enough speed or if you throw it wrong where you can't throw it straight up you know you have to throw it at the exact right angle so it's actually more almost parallel to the ground uh, because if you throw it too high up at too high an angle it will go up and then it will nose down and not be able to recover and then it goes straight into the ground and so the reason why that's the main reason why I'm avoiding throwing it anymore I used to do it all the time but now it's uh, I keep throwing it wrong and that it's a day record because you throw it wrong once and then it's like oh gotta take it back home to fix it up so my priority is making more functional landing gear for kind of off-road takeoffs and, and everything and then the uh, I do FPV flying with the fixed wing and so I actually went and got my ham license and uh, that's you know amateur radio and so I can work with uh, higher powered um, radio frequencies and so a lot of times it's for like like really high-end kind of walkie-talkies where you can talk to people across the county and stuff uh, from your house uh, but you also need to be certified for some of the FPV gear so that you're not like blocking somebody's important radio channels and like the police use you know you know the high the high on walkie talkies and stuff that go for miles and everything and you don't want to interfere with that and there's a lot of cool stuff you can do once you uh, have your ham license you can talk to satellites you know when they're in the right place you can do things where you can literally uh, bounce your your signals off the stratosphere and so from like the United States you can you know talk to people from Japan uh, if you can bounce your signal off the stratosphere properly you can also uh, bounce your signal off the moon I kid you not and uh, sometimes you can communicate with uh, the ISS, the International Space Station. And then a lot of the other thing people do is they do balloons uh, where you can you know, communicate with a balloon and get, you know, temperatures and stuff, weather balloons. One of the we've been having the balloon uh, Armageddon recently and so one of the last balloons we blew up was actually uh, a ham balloon or an uh, amateur radio balloon that was you know you just do it for fun uh, to put a balloon like a weather balloon and stuff together it, it's only like $15 worth of parts so a lot of people have been doing that for fun I was listening to this podcast and everyone was laughing because, you know, it's $15 worth of parts for, you know, like a high school or uh, amateur radio club. They put it together and they sp and they sent like two missiles after it. And each missile is like $400,000. So it was like $800,000 to destroy a $15, you know, hobby balloon. And uh, the reason why they have to use missiles is because the the fighter jets, the higher up you go, the less air there is to go over the wings. So to 
combat that, you have to go faster and faster. If you want to be able to fly forward and still be able to have control of the airplane. And so once you get to a certain speed, you can't use uh, the gun, you know, bullets on the plane. Because there's a chance that you'll shoot out the bullet and then it will actually hit you uh, as you're flying forward. And it can jam the engine and everything. And so that's why they have to use missiles for these balloons. So I didn't know that. There's a certain altitude and uh, speed where you can't use the main uh, the main guns on a you know on like an F-22 in fighter jets. So yeah, so I'm going to be printing a lot more and designing and stuff. And I still have the train set I have to finish. I've like accumulated all the parts and it's something I'm doing miniatures for and I'm going to be filming, but that's the other thing the 3D printer is going to help. It's going to help me build uh, buildings and small houses. And I also have a, cr a circuit. Uh, which is like a vinyl. It is a vinyl cutter, but it also cuts cardstock and, and things like that. And so I found that at a thrift, stock, a thrift store. And I got the software up and running to where I can do my own, you know, cardboard cutouts. And so I'm going to use that to do miniatures as well. And like structural things where I design it on the computer and then it cuts them. for that I guess no one's done that map or something I don't know but I'll be right back
Okay, I'm back. Let's try something with actual opponents. Uh, let's see what is there. What? There's this weird thing where I will show you like four community. Creations, or whatever it is, one, two, three, four, five. But uh, it will. What is the word? It doesn't let you like refresh it yourself. So that's kind of annoying because it's like I want to see more than what they pick. much done last night. That was ridiculous. I started job hunting, figuring out places to apply to. Um, I finished editing uh, this visual audio book I'm doing, so now it's rendering. It rendered the first, um, the first 19 chapters. No, not 19. It re finished the first 10 sections, and now it's rendering the next, uh, the final set. the group because they kind of force you out like exactly how they did but yeah so I finished editing that and the uh, two it's kind of a two-step process where you have to render uh, the way I do it you have to render the, uh, the actual video and audio together and then uh, once it does that I have the CRT which is the file that says what text and when it happens uh, so you can align the audio with text and uh, so I do that and normally it's a simple thing where you can embed it into the video uh, but the whole reason why I'm doing this visual audio book is it's supposed to be you know, uh, 
in a way to where you can read along with the narration of the book and also uh, look at the photographs. So it's kind of a way to like, like if you like to do multiple things at once, you can read along, listen, and that reinforces it. And then if you get kind of tired of reading, you still have the photographs to look at as the narration continues. So it's like a multi-sensory uh, experience. And so uh, that's why the subtitles, instead of just being like an option, uh, they're going to be burned into the video. And so that means it has to be rendered again uh, with the subtitles once the first render is done. But it takes, I don't have to render in Blender. I, it's a simple script that uh, you can uh, run in uh, FFmpeg. So it still has that to do. And I'll probably start that tonight. all over the place. This is literally like the best I've seen the drive avatars do. It's kind of cheating. But I didn't want to rewind. Two. Once I get in front, I don't know what it is, but I like get in the zone, and then it's like all downhill for everyone else. Also, starting this other editing on Twitch, I've done the classical graph, which is animated photography and classical music, and it's piano music uh, that I used uh, with kind of special software of uh, synthesized a piano, and so it's done with like this cool sampling where it's like a, it's like two gigs of audio files. And so what the computer does is you play along with your MIDI keyboard and that connects to your PC 
uh, but like when you hit the key uh, instead of being like an artificial synthesized tone it's an actual recording of of a piano hitting that one key and so it's like hundreds of you know audio files where it's like soft press hard press and then you have different options where you can say you know okay I want the microphone that's far away and hearing the ambience of the piano and everything so it's still you know synthetic but it's using real world audio uh, to create the to create the music the downside is that there's a little bit of lag because uh, my audio card isn't it's just the default one in the PC so you do need a, a beefy uh, you know, audio card for that but anyway I found uh, a library of uh, MIDI files which is the file that is digital uh, file for like editors and and everything for keyboards and stuff and so I was able to pipe that through the synthesizer and have it play that way so that's how I got the classical music it's all public domain classical uh, sheet music and stuff and uh, so that's how I did that and uh, classical graph came out in like 2020 during the uh, during the pandemic but right after this I plan on editing some of the footage for something else again it's going to be like a musical focused theme but it's mainly going to be for YouTube with licensed music I tried uploading the classical graph to YouTube and it was just a headache because even though it is open source music and stuff and I did create it myself um, and it's not like a recording from a CD or anything uh, it was so I'm not saying it was like so great but it was so kind of well played that <laughs> the YouTube algorithm that checks for copyrighted music kept flagging a lot of the songs as being oh you stole it from this CD or oh you stole it for that when really it wasn't and so I had to constantly go through and say no 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 it's not this it's not that and dispute each one and so I had the classical graph sitting there as private videos that was going to be scheduled but I just decided you know what, I'm not publishing it there So it's on Twitch. Twitch didn't care so much about most of the music, but so if you subscribe to the Thumbs United uh, Twitch channel, then you can access all that. There's a ton of videos that I have that's available only to subscribers. So the project I'm going to be working on again is editing footage from Ireland. Uh, mostly because for the classical graph I did edit uh, the 35mm photos from the DSLR and then I have 3D photos from my 3D JVC camera. But I don't know where my edits went for... Uh, I had like 4K footage. No, it's 2.7K footage. And I just... I was pretty sure I edited it. 
but I can't find the renders anywhere. I've searched on all the hard drives and like there's a lot of hard drives. And what I do now is I have a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, and it says, okay, this project's huh, this hard drive on that hard drive, this hard drive is full and everything. So it's pretty well organized, uh, but I haven't organized it in a couple of months. And so, uh, uh, hit the wrong button. And so there's a lot of missing, you know, I switched some stuff around and I have newer hard drives that I filled up with other stuff. But even with all that, I still wasn't able to find it. So it's very weird. Very weird. But so I'm planning on re-editing the... The, the HD footage and it's video and stuff so I'm looking forward to that Ireland was a lot of fun going to I went to Dublin, Cork and up but I'm having a really hard time with some traction control. I'm gonna check to see if it's even on. That's why I'm having such a hard time. I knew, I knew something was off. Some of the cars that kind of not designed well, and so like there's this Jaguar, and it's a high-end one. And it's like V12, you know, it's a super sport car, and uh, a lot of it, uh, the traction control does most of the work. And these cars are actually, if you didn't have the traction control and everything on then they're just undrivable 
uh, they slip and slide all over the place and they don't go straight. something better but, yeah. and so like on these higher end cars you can you know customize it and stuff and actually turn off you know traction control this or you have different settings to Martin but like I said they have they're very powerful sometimes too powerful I was driving a uh, Camaro in real life I didn't own it I was, it was a rental car and uh, I told my cousin I was like you know this car is it's fun but the thing is a death trap and then I looked up the price and I was like you know what it's, it was really affordable and I was like that's why everyone likes them but the reason why it's a death trap is like you barely touch the accelerator and it it will go you know pretty well uh except that it will like take off and angle to the right and everything so it's it's like you're constantly having to fight the car just to go straight and i was like what's up with that I think we did another one with nobody's nobody's here. I don't know why I'm not getting any driver tires. Yeah, it was actually funny I'm going back to the Camaro story. So, like, I go to the speed limit, and the way I drive is a lot of times I don't put myself into, you know, bad situations. Like, I actually stay the appropriate distance away from somebody I'm driving behind. Nowadays, you know, especially in Michigan. If someone thinks you're going too slow, they'll go within, you know, three feet of your bumper to try to push you out of the way. And it makes absolutely no sense because I have several people do that when I'm going the speed limit. Uh, and there's like, there's three other lanes that could go around where there's nobody. 
And it's not like, oh, an exit's coming off and they want to push you because they don't want to change lanes. They just push you for no reason. And it's like, you saw me. Like, the speed limit will be 70 and I have the cruise control on 70. And uh, they will come flying up straight behind me, slam on their brakes, and get all angry that I'm going the speed. And it's like, you came up to me. You knew I was going slower than you. Why didn't you change lanes? way back there I, was like, I have no idea how you know everyone else thinks that's okay it happens non-stop it's like they just figure out two seconds before it's too late that they're not going the same speed as you and then my favorite is I'll be behind a semi and they'll come up flying behind me and try to push me out of the way and it's just like there's nowhere for me to go in terms of speeding up you see the semi in front of me but uh, so I had the Camaro and I'm driving it you know speed limit and everything and it was funny because my art teacher uh, it was art for um, it was art appreciation which is a joke and I'll tell you why it's a joke later but uh, we took off at the same time she's in a minivan and she's like pushing me to get out of the way on the freeway we just left class and so I don't know if she knew I was the one in the Camaro but it was hilarious because there she is in the minivan she's blasting out of there but uh, the reason why art appreciation is a joke uh, is it's, it's not a joke for, for everyone else uh, but for I went to community college and so that's like a two year degree but I for the first two years I kind of took a lot of different classes because I wasn't sure what I wanted to and wanted to do and there was actually a huge kerfuffle with the uh with the counselors where they essentially never told me I I kept waiting for this one class to become available and they're like oh we don't offer it we don't offer it so that happened a couple of years because it's only offered in winter so I would wait to winter and then see the counselor and they say oh we're not offering this year and I was like how am I supposed to get this degree then so the truth came out that because I started at a certain time they changed the degree requirement but didn't tell Nobody knew that. So the actual class I needed was offered, uh, but it was under a different name. So that was stupid. But so going back to the point where the art appreciation was kind of a joke was for the first two years I was going to do. I wanted to be, you know, an art teacher. I would work in education. And so I took, uh, you know, basic drawing, advanced drawing, two-dimensional design. I did um, actual art education classes. And and so that was just, you know, that was at the college. And then I did film processing and other stuff at, at the Flint Institute of Art, Arts as well. And so the reason why the art appreciation was a joke was even though I had all those humanity classes, all those art classes and everything, they didn't consider it as a way for me, as one of my humanities for my degree. So I had to take uh, another art class. Well, it had to be a humanities, but I was like, I'll do another art class because art is fun. And so I... Uh, I had to go back to the beginning and art appreciation, even though I was a higher level. And it was fun. Like, it was actually a lot of fun. But that's kind of why I was a joke. It's because, like, I came in there and, you know, most of the people are just... Well, one, it was kind of a funny class because a lot of it was... Uh, high schoolers doing extracurricular stuff 
with the college with the college so it was like really you know a ton of young people and I don't remember how old I was I was like 20 26 or 27 Anything goes. I'm going to go with a Lamborghini. So that was funny. And then uh, the other thing was it was my final year and they're like, oh, you need an English class. And I was like, what? Because I tested out of English 101 and then I, it was like English 102 or 202. And so I took that years ago and they're like, oh, it says you don't have an English class. I was like, no. So I had to pull out my grades and I was like, I passed this class pretty well. And they're like, that's weird. So they tried to make me take, you know, another English class when I had already passed the higher version and tested it out at the lower version. So that, uh, my experience with college was really backwards. Really backwards. This is gonna go. But there are a lot of good drivers. That was terrible. I'll be right back.
Okay. Now I'm back. I'm going to do some off-roading stuff. This fort is one of my favorite ones. I don't know what is happening, that was a disaster.
Last place. We're gonna try it again with a different car there. I think I already pressed the wrong button. I did. Switch over to Destiny. Also the headache of licensing music where you can have music that you have licensed or created yourself and it's automatically pulled down by you know the bots at YouTube uh, I kind of decided to do my own web hosting and so I using a peer tube instance uh, that I host myself and you can see the different videos that I have uploaded here so we have um, the quotations which is educational and uh, you can see or right now what we're doing is we're streaming uh, the video and so this is the Junior Classics Volume 1 this is the 2D edition and what's nice about this is we can go and uh, we can download the video we have a wide variety of uh, downloading options and what's nice is that you can do a direct download uh, if you don't know how to torrent but you can also get the torrent and I, I really uh, suggest you use the torrenting because that will help out uh, with bandwidth costs uh, it's fully seeded uh, but if more people torrent then it helps you know other people get the content as well and so uh, there's 1080p uh, there is uh, you know low quality or you can get the audio only as well and so in addition to this uh, we have the it's multi-format project uh, the junior classics volume one so we have the stereograph and so if you have the VR goggles uh, for your smartphone what you d could do is you could stream this uh, with any web browser stream it on your phone and okay I'm back I'm back. I go. I have no idea what this is. And my internet's going out. So I don't know what's going on. We might have to end this here. We'll see. See you at my doorstep again. You have a taken infestation. I very much appreciate your help with. How bad is this infestation? You'll soon see how.
legacy of our cabal allies. Using pyramid precisely. Protect that device and we'll clear out the blight. And how much has this been tested? It's being tested right now. By you.
Guardian, you have my thanks. Especially for continuing to keep the EDZ safe amongst all the hubbub going on. We're going to end it. I'm dropping so many frames. I don't know what's going on, but I'll see you.